Hi, thank you all for coming out today. As I've mentioned earlier in the afternoon, for those who weren't here at the time, April is Global Astronomy Month, and the Northern Virginia Astronomy Club, which I'm a member of, uh, as part of our outreach for Global Astronomy Month, do an Astronomy Day today. And we're really lucky in the D.C. area. People in Newton, Iowa don't have this kind of uh, ability, but we're able to draw on some of the really fantastic speakers in the Washington, D.C. area, and our next speaker is our keynote for the day. And I want to tell you a little bit about Eric Linus. He is a software engineer in the Planetary Environments Laboratory at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in suburban Maryland. He leads the software effort on the Mars Organic Molecule Analyzer instrument that is scheduled to arrive on Mars in 2021 aboard the European ExoMars mission. Previously, he developed software for the sample analysis at Mars Instrument aboard the rover Curiosity and worked on the operations team during the landing of Curiosity on Mars. Uh, about Eric's uh, talk, it's Curiosity and ExoMars, a tale of two Martian rovers. Uh, in 2021, as many as five rovers could be studying the Martian surface. The search for life or conditions compatible with life is the obsession of all of them. This presentation focuses on the NASA Curiosity rover and the European ExoMars rover, discussing the reasons that Mars is so interesting, what the rovers are looking for, what they've discovered so far, and how they go about doing their jobs every day. Basically, in, in short, Eric is who I want to be when I grow up someday. <laughs> he, has, he has got the coolest job. So, Eric Linus. Oh, thank you. Can everyone hear me okay? All right, great. Well, thanks so much for that great introduction. So, uh, yeah, I am very lucky to have this job um, working on rovers. I'm working on two rovers is really amazing. Uh, on the left here, we have Curiosity. Of course, most people know uh, in this group, I'm, uh, it's been on Mars for five and a half years or so now, uh, and it's going strong. Uh, on the right is uh, the ExoMars rover, which is a European rover that's supposed to launch in 2020 and arrive in 2021 on Mars. Uh, and although I work, f it's a European rover, and I work for NASA, NASA is providing the, the main science instrument within the rover. So the Europeans are building everything except this one science instrument that we're building. Um, I always like to start my talk out with some things. I, I, I'm kind of a little intimidated talking here, actually. <laughs> I talk a lot to schools and things, and uh, I'm kind of an amateur astronomer myself, and I know uh, a lot of you are going to know more about this topic uh, than I do, maybe, in some of the stuff I talk about. Uh, but I have a couple facts to remember. One thing is, especially when I talk to schools, the, the fact is there's no life has ever been discovered outside of Earth. We've had enormous efforts, the SETI project, rovers to Mars, all over the planets, and no one's ever found any life outside of Earth. That's a fundamental fact right now. Despite that fact, there are thousands of people who call themselves astrobiologists who <laughs> have never found anything. <laughs> Another thing is pl planets change dramatically over geologic time. So. Uh, one of the things we have to do is figure out how, they, how they've changed. We know a lot about how Earth has changed, but it's a lot harder to know about other planets. Um, and like uh, Dave was saying in his introduction, there could be five rovers roving around Mars in 2021. So the U.S. has the Curiosity rover and still the Opportunity rover, which is on its 14th year, I think, driving around Mars. Uh, the European ExoMars rover. There's another American rover, another NASA rover landing in 20. Uh, in 20, 2021, and then the Chinese are working on a rover. I don't know much about that one, but it, the rumor is that, that they're working on a rover. Uh, so a little about me. This is me, like a uh, few months before Curiosity launched, Curiosity launched and that's the, the actual rover sitting in a clean room. And the lighting is interesting because they, light, they lighted it, lit it with uh, a Mars light. Like they made the, the, the lights in the room were a zipper or more, even though it's not solar powered. Uh, they still lit it because it was close enough to launch. They wanted to give it realistic conditions. Like he said, I'm a software engineer. I'm not a scientist. I don't have a PhD. I went to, I started out programming on a TRS-80 in the, the 70s. Anyone else do that? <laughs> All right, good for you. Uh, I went to Iowa State University. I learned about email in my junior year, I think. I'd never heard of it before. Uh, I got a job. I come from Pittsburgh. And so my, one of my first jobs was programming software in, uh, as I say in Pittsburgh, a steel mill. 
and I've worked on subways. I worked on a bunch of other stuff before I eventually found uh, NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. Uh, the stuff I did, the automation, my background in controlling real things was helpful uh, in finding the work at, at Goddard. So the planetary, in the, uh, wait, the, the solar system exploration division is a part of Goddard that specifically makes science instruments to go to the planets. We don't do Earth in the solar system exploration division, we, we're studying the planets. And Mars, of course, is a big target. Uh, so what I really do is I write software, ideally. <laughs> uh, so I write the software that operates actually on the instrument and runs the instrument while it's sitting on Mars or whatever planet it's on. Uh, I also am responsible for the, for the data coming back from our scientific instrument, getting it, distributing it to the scientists who need it, uh, and writing them tools to look at the data. Uh, and then we run experiments. I write the software to run experiments in our labs to help understand the data from Mars. So we'll, we'll try to find it. If we're looking at Mar a rock from Mars, we'll try to find one on Earth. We think, oh, this could be this rock. So we'll find one on, on Earth and then do tests on that and see if we can compare the results. And then the other thing I, like, I get to work on sometimes is like dreaming up whole new missions. Uh, and that's, like <laughs> that's the really fun part of my job. So the guys I work with in the Planetary Environments Lab or the Solar System Exploration Division, the, some of these scientists I work with, brilliant, brilliant scientists, they just dream up new missions. So it's like, I want to know something. I want to know, I mean, where's the most likely place to find life in the solar system? They'll just invent some vision, some idea. So there was a guy, he's not actually in, at NASA, but uh, at Cornell, Steve Squires, he just dreamed up this Mars rover and pitched it to, to NASA, and NASA funded him to build two rovers, the Spirit and Opportunity. I mean, he didn't do it just himself. He, he was like the mastermind, but he found people to say, I can build this, I can build this motor to, to drive it. I can build this camera that will live in this environment. And he put all that together, and uh, NASA went for it. So some of the people I work for came up with this, this thing, it's called Dragonfly. Has anyone heard of that? So we're, I don't know if NASA's gonna, you've heard of that one? This is a fantastic mission to Titan, a moon of Saturn, uh, and it's, gonna, it's a quadcopter. So it's not a rover, it's like a rover, but it has propellers instead of wheels, and it flies from one spot to another. Uh, we're, we're hoping that NASA will go for it, we're working on that right now, and uh, a year from now or so we'll find out if they're going to really fund it. Because uh, Titan, does anyone know about much about Titan? Titan has a very thick atmosphere. It's actually thicker than Earth's. And it has a low gravity. So those two things in combination make, a, a f make flying feasible. It's, uh, it will be nuclear powered. Yeah, Titan's a little far away to get much solar power. Uh, one of the other things they came up with, like my direct boss came up with this sample analysis at Mars instrument, an instrument to put in a rover uh, in, ended up in Curiosity uh, to, to like a it's, a, it's a chemistry lab inside a rover. You can drop it a solid sample and it's going to tell you what atoms, what molecules it's made out of. Okay, so getting back to our rovers. Uh, I'm going to start talking about, after this, I'm going to get a little bit into Mars science so you can see why these two are different, uh, what the differences are. Uh, in summary, Curiosity is a big rover. It's the size of a car, or an SUV. It weighs 2,000 pounds. It's got a two-year, its its primary mission was two years, which has been over for over two years now. It's been almost five and a half years. It's nuclear powered, and when I say nuclear powered, it has a little bit of plutonium in there that gets hot. And they just use that heat to generate electricity and to charge batteries and to keep the rover warm. Uh, its goal was to search for habitable conditions. It wasn't actually looking for life. It, curiosity is looking to see if there had been conditions compatible with life in the past. Um, it has a little drill that only goes up to six, six centimeters deep, but it can drive great distances. And so far, it's gone about 20 kilometers. Uh, the ExoMars is a much smaller rover. It's more like the size of the Spirit or Opportunity. It's a smaller rover. It's a, only a seven-month mission. It's solar-powered, uh, but it's searching for uh, extant life. It's searching to see if there's life, if it can find life on Mars now. So, I'll back up a little bit and talk about 
why we go to Mars in particular. What makes Mars so interesting? So I have a little quiz. I thought there'd be there's a few kids in here. This is good. Uh, so bigger or smaller than Earth? Mars. Smaller, yeah. Everybody got that. So it's a. Uh, it's about you could by volume you could fit eight eight Mars and one Earth. By it's the uh, the gravity is about 38 percent of uh, about a third of Earth's. Uh, closer or farther from the sun? Farther. Farther. <laughs> Good. Uh, yeah, it's cl it's the fourth planet, of course. Uh, it's closest to Earth. It's 34 million miles, but most of the but the average distance uh, is more like 50 or 60 million miles. Um, important fact is it takes between five and 20 minutes for light to get from Mars to Earth. So when you're operating a rover. There's no joystick control that does its own thing and sends you the data back. To give you a little sense of the scale, scale we're talking about here, if, if you were to shrink the Earth down to a sesame seed, then Mars would be like the size of like a pinhead, and it would be on the other side of a football field from you. So just trying to give you a sense of the scale. Can imagine stay at one of a football field, but you're on a little sesame seed. <laughs> it's really, really far away. <laughs> um, this is a cool picture. This is the Earth as seen from Mars. So Curiosity took this picture, just looked up at the sky. And this is a zoom, actually. So actually, just that little dot. So that's what the Earth looks like. It's a, it's a, it's a long way off. Uh, cold or hot? Mars. Cold. Yeah, it's very cold. It actually does occasionally on a really hot, hot summer day maybe get above freezing point. But uh, it, it, it can get very cold, minus 195 degrees Fahrenheit. It also has extreme temperature ranges every day. Uh, it will get, it could be, maybe it gets up to 30 degrees in the mid-afternoon, but it can be minus 105 th the same night. Uh, because it's a very thin atmosphere, so it quickly changes temperature. How about this? Does a pocket compass work on Mars? You guys know? Kids know? No, a compass, this, compasses do not work on Mars because it has almost no magnetic field. It, I guess it has some tiny, somewhat measurable magnetic field, but your compass wouldn't work. And this turns out to be one of the quintessential features of Mars. One of the most important features. How about water? Is there water on Mars? Yes. There's, there's water on Mars, but it's trapped in the ice or the subsurface. Uh, there's no puddles. There are no streams or lakes. There are water molecules, a lot of them, uh, but they're they're trapped in the surface and they're all ice. Of course, the, temp the uh, pressure on Mars is very, very low, so the boiling point of water is also very low. So Mars summary, it's cold. The lack of a magnetic field means it's heavily radiated by the sun. The sun's spewing particles all the time, high energy particles, and they're soaking Mars. We are protected on Earth from our magnetic field, but Mars is not. It's mostly dry. There's water there, but it's mostly dry. Uh, if you were to gr grab a scoop full of Martian soil and pull the water out of it, you would get a tiny amount of water compared to what you could get, say, on Earth. Um, and it's very far away. So it really doesn't seem like that great a place to go. <laughs> but planets change. I mentioned at the beginning, planets do change. Uh, Earth, of course, the continents, there used to be one big continent, right, and Pangaea. Before that, uh, it had spread out, and they think it actually had been formed one continent many times in a cycle of, co of continental drift, drifting back and forth. Uh, so our planet's constantly changing. The, uh, the environment, the atmosphere, if you were to time travel to a, a billion years ago to Earth, you would suffocate because there wouldn't be enough oxygen. For most of the life of Earth, there's been very little oxygen in the atmosphere. So most of the life that we know today would not have been able to live uh, 
a billion years ago because it just wasn't the right atmosphere. So pla planets change, and they change in, ge in geologic time, they can change rapidly. Uh, I made this little plot of, <laughs> we have this red line is temperature, <laughs> and this is the solar system. So if you go all the way out in the Kuiper belt here, you're almost absolute zero. And all these planets here, you get a little bit warmer, but this is what we call the too cold zone. And then you go just to Venus, and now it's 800 and over 800 degrees on the surface. So we live here, Earth is here in this nice Goldilocks zone. Uh, and the question is maybe, you know, maybe if we went back long enough, the Goldilocks zone would be a little bigger and maybe it would, would have had Mars inside that zone too. So here's an artist idea of what billions of years ago, it's possible Mars looked like that. Possible it had oceans and clouds uh, and a denser, warmer atmosphere. So what happened? Does anyone know what happened about three billion years ago that might have turned that turned Mars from an Earth-like planet into what it is today? Here, I gotta Oops, see if I can get this started. This is a nice video NASA made. That's the sun. And this is an, an animation of the right now, this is Mars in here. It's got its it still has its a magnetic field, so the solar radiation is going around it. But it died, estimated about three billion years ago. The magnetic field went away. And when that happened, uh, the the sun's solar radiation eventually, in relatively short time, blew away the atmosphere of Mars. Um, we think what happened was Mars is a little bit smaller than Earth, and it's we, we believe the molten core in the Earth's rotation generates like this dynamo effect and creates the magnetic field around the Earth. Well, Mars is smaller and it just froze up. Its heat just was lost and the circulation stopped and it just turned into a dead rock in space. And so the, the uh, uh, magnetic field went away. That sucked away the uh, atmosphere. When the atmosphere has went away, the oceans boil off. Because if you, if you get rid of the atmospheric pressure, you know, if you go up in the mountains, the boiling point of water sh starts to go down and down and down. Well, if you can imagine you had one one hundredth the pressure we have on Earth, the boiling point, I don't know what it is, it was much lower. So the, ap the uh, oceans just disappeared. Oops. So what happens when you have three billion years, uh, the numbers depends on who you talk to, I'm using the number three billion. <laughs> Three billion years of a bombardment by solar radiation. Um, a couple things happen, and one really important thing for us is any kind of evidence of life. If there was an amino acid or a DNA molecule sitting on the surface of Mars three billion years ago, the solar radiation would have hit it and broken it into pieces. The carbons and the hydrogens would have broken into their parts. You would no have no longer have a large organic molecule that you could say this is de definitively life. So this is one of the big challenges for the rovers is everything on the surface has been sitting there with this radiation. The other thing is the solar radiation is also a danger to the astronauts. So if, if you go to Mars uh, you're going to have to endure this radiation. And you can survive it for a while. It's about 10 times what you get on Earth. Uh, but it's a problem. You have to deal with it. Uh, in fact, the early studies of going to Mars that they did in the 60s had these spaceships that were lined with lead because they were so afraid of the radiation that the astronauts would get. But there is a simple solution to the radiation problem. Anyone have any ideas? What's that? Water, right? If you could have a magnetic field. What? Robotics. Robotics? Send a robot? Yes. <laughs> the robot doesn't care that much. Caves? What? Caves? Caves. That's the one I was looking for. Yeah, a lot of people are saying the astronauts could go and they could live underground because the ground is a good absorber of this radiation. 
uh, and you wouldn't need much. Water is a good one too because you you have to have water anyway, so you could live in a place where the water is stored over your head and it's protecting you from the radiation. But underground, you don't have to bring anything. You, if you could just dig underground, it protects you. But there's a theory, the astronauts are thinking about doing this, but there's a theory that maybe the microbes that lived, may, if they lived on Mars three billion years ago, they evolved to live underground. And th they've done all, scientists have done some research on this, and they think if you went two meters down, you would have survived, the, the radiation wouldn't affect you. If you could get two meters below the surface, even after three billion years, you could survive that deep. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a reasonable theory. So, oh. Yes, exactly. And this is like a little animation of that. Uh, they're a rover with a very deep drill. It's trying to get down there. So if you're looking for ex existing life on Mars, right now that's the best thought. The also the thought is there could be water down there. There could be more water. Uh, So if we go back to comparing the two rovers, uh, really curiosity, like I said, it's answering the question, was Mars ever habitable? It's, it can drive great distances much further than the uh, ExoMars rover, uh, but it drills, it's a shallow drill and it's more looking to see what was Mars like a long time ago. Whereas ExoMars, it probably won't travel, it's a short mission, it probably won't travel more than a couple kilometers in its lifetime, but it will go two meters deep. Um, the other thing, so ExoMars will land in 2021, so it's going to be a while. And, uh, probably, I expect Curiosity to still be running. The, the half-life of that plutonium is 18 years, so its power source sh should be good for after 18 years it will still be running. It just won't have as, it'll have a shorter life, I mean a shorter daytime. Okay, now I'm going to just st jump in to talk about Curiosity itself. Since ExoMars is a future mission, there's a lot less, there's no pictures from Mars from it, so <laughs> we'll talk about Curiosity. So, is people familiar with Curiosity? You guys know much about it? Okay, okay, good. So this is, this is introductory. There are a bunch of instruments on it. Like I say, it's big. Um, it has a... Uh, the Dan instruments are looking at neutrons straight down. Uh, it has a weather station, so it's you know your basic temperature, wind direction, wind speed, uh, pressure, atmospheric pressure. Uh, it has a really nice cameras. In fact, there are something like 17 cameras. Uh, in the mass, there's a chem cam, which is a really cool instrument. It's a, it has a laser. It shoots this laser. Can hit a rock. I have a video a little bit later and. Uh, then it has a telescope and it looks at what happened and does like spectroscopy on the little f little flame there and they can tell a little bit about what that rock was. Uh, it has, I'm gonna go through all of them. Uh, th and what I'm very interested in is SAM. So SAM, Sample Analysis of Mars, is the chemistry lab I mentioned that we built at Goddard and that I worked on and I still, I still work on it, it's still running. And this is the one where we take a solid sample, we drop it in, and it's, it's, a, it's a mass spectrometer, basically, with a bunch of extra features in it. <laughs> uh, and it tells you what atoms, molecules uh, are, are made of that, that sample is made out of. Uh, oh. Yeah, so some of the numbers. Uh, the arm has a drill, but also has a scoop. Uh, it has a microscope on it, so they can scoop up a little bit and look at it really, really closely. Uh, they can also ha take pictures, that's how it takes its selfie, it has a camera on the arm, so it reaches its arm out and takes pictures of itself. It has 17 cameras, I don't know how they get that data back, it's a lot of cameras. <laughs> a lot of them are for navigation, so they're down low on the body and in the front and back t to see, make sure it doesn't run into anything. Uh, I told you about the laser in the mast. It has uh, the full, full chemistry laboratory that we work on, the weather station, uh, nuclear power, and it's 2,000 pounds. So I think the next picture, this is the same, taken at the same place as this. I try to give you some scale. Uh, so this is about 
four feet high here. And you can see this is the real thing shortly before launch. And you notice it's covered with wires and tape. Like <laughs> when you look at the pictures, you don't really notice that. But I just remember be, when you saw it, it's just like, why are all this wires and there's wires and tape everywhere? <laughs> uh, this is it. More recently, I was telling you one of the selfies it took. What it does is it puts this camera out here and takes a bunch of pictures, and then they sew them together later, and they erase the arm, so it looks like someone else was standing there. But. <laughs> But this is a series of pictures. But look how dirty it is. You know, you see the other slide? I was like all in a bunny suit and wrapped up and we were so careful to keep it clean and now it's a filthy mess. But uh, the, the dust on Mars is, is like the moon or something. It's really, really fine, really uh, nasty stuff. It's, uh, it's, it gets into everything. They were worried, I don't know if the, uh, I mentioned earlier, op the rover Opportunity has been running for uh, over 13 years, I wish I knew the exact number, but I think it's in its 14th year of running. They thought it would only last for a few months because they thought the dust would cover the solar panels. But it turned out that the, it does cover the solar panels, but then the wind comes and blows it off. So it kind of, it, it just keeps going and going. How abrasive is the dust? Is it like a, a sandblast machine or is it? It's pretty abrasive. Yeah, I don't know how bad it is. Uh, I'm going to show a movie this, uh, about how we landed on Mars, and they were very concerned about the dust damaging, blowing the dust around when they landed and damaging it because it is so abrasive. Um, so if you're going to send this awesome exploring rover to Mars, one of the big questions is where do you land? Imagine if you were a Martian and you're studying the Earth and you've never been there before, do you land in the Amazon? Do you, do you land in Kansas? I mean, you, you, <laughs> where, where do you choose to land? It makes a big difference, right? If you land in Antarctica, you're not going to find anything. Las Vegas. Las Vegas. <laughs> That's probably a good spot to land because it's flat, right? It's like you would not want to land in, uh, in a forest because your rover's going to fall over. You can't drive around a forest. You're not going to land in Mount Everest or in the Himalayas because it's too rugged. So, so in fact, the early like Viking missions, they found this vast flat area that was as boring as possible to land in. But of course, it's also your least likely to, to find anything interesting. Um, here's some of the landing sites. Uh, there was two amazing, I, I, don't, I didn't put any slides in this, the, these Viking missions that launched in the 70s were fantastic missions. Um, they, you can see where they landed on Mars here, Viking 1 and 2. They lasted for about four years. Uh, and it was amazing what they did, and, uh, and they were looking for life, existing life. Uh, like the ExoMars mission, and they were really, really successful at finding none. So <laughs> they, they were, they, after the mission, they kind of definitively told, told everybody, it's like, there's no life on Mars. And so it was a long, long time before we went back to Mars. People started looking at the data and said, well, wait a second. Maybe there had been life, or actually some of this data is a little bit ambiguous. Uh, so the more they looked at it, uh, but uh, those are really superb missions, what they did that, well, they sent a really heavy thing there in the, in the 70s. Do you have a question? Yeah, I have a question. So, um, the new program that you're going to send in 2021, you say it's going to be able to go kilometers when it gets there. How, do you have any idea where you're going to land it? Yes. They've picked a landing site. It's near the equator. I can't remember the name now. It's one of these Martian names. But yeah, there is a they picked a place that looks interesting. Uh, and unlike the, uh, like the Viking missions, they had never been to Mars before. They didn't know much about Mars, and they weren't that good at landing. We're gotten better at landing, so they can pick a much more interesting spot now. They don't have to pick a, a New Mexico-sized piece of land that's all flat. They're, they found some more interesting spots. But that's a good question. I can't remember the name of the landing spot for the ExoMars mission. Um, the, I have, this is where uh, Curiosity landed. It's in this crater called Gale Crater, who uh, named after an amateur astronomer named, uh, I think, Walter Gale, Australian astronomer. Uh, it's a really old crater, over three, around three and a half billion years old. Uh, it's about 96 miles in diameter. And in the middle is a 
five or six kilometer high mountain. So originally that was not there. There would have been a small mountain from the impact, but this m mountain formed in that by blowing, blowing dust and uh, sand. So Curiosity landed right in here. This ellipse is what they call the landing ellipse. So the engineers who designed the whole landing sequence said we can land in a space this big. It's about, I think it's about 30 kilometers across this way. So it was a very precise landing. And they had to be accurate because this is all mountains over here. I'll show you some pictures. And this is mountains. You did not want to land on either side of that. You really wanted to get here. Because the goal of the mission was to start climbing this mountain. So just like on Earth, if you can climb a mountain as you go up in altitude, you're looking at sort of the, his the ge geologic history of that place. Uh, so the idea was to start at the bottom where they thought they saw possible uh, deltas from old rivers or looked like this could be could have been a, uh, a, a bottom of a sea of a small sea and then to, to work their way up which it turned out to be a good choice just to give you an idea there's New York and that big ring is how big that crater is so it's a big, this is a really big crater, and that is the, the size of the landing ellipse. So if that were on a map of, the, of New York, there's New York and Philadelphia, so it's a, give you a sense of the scale on Earth. So now, getting a 2,000 pound rover to Mars is, is pretty, is, is one of the hardest things that NASA has done. And it's, uh, I think Mars has been the target of more uh, rockets than any other planet and it's the one with the by far the most failures it used to be it used to be Mars was winning M Mars had more there were more failed missions to Mars than successful <laughs> missions and I think only recently it's about even and it's something like 25 to 25 it's it's around that number maybe 24 to 26 I'm not sure the numbers now right now uh, <coughs> The, the Russians tried something like 15 times and never successfully operated something on Mars. They had one that landed and it communicated for a few seconds and they called that success. But it, <laughs> it had a, a part, it wasn't even an image, it was just partial data. Uh, they tried it, that was mostly in the 60s and 70s. They tried again uh, a couple years ago and they failed again with, uh, they didn't even get out of Earth, Earth orbit. Uh, so it's 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 hard to go to Mars. Um, show you a little bit about packing for Mars. So the rover has these big old wheels. I, I wish I brought a model. I have a model of one. I, it's they're about this big. The wheels are pretty big. Uh, they do this sort of origami and they tie them all up and they get them all squished up and they fit it in this capsule. So as it's flying to Mars, it's closed inside this. This capsule would close up, and that's how it travels to Mars. Then they take that whole thing, that section up there, and they put it in this capsule here, which goes on top of the rocket. And these are the that gives you a size of this sense of the size of these fairings that go on either side, covering it up. This is it on the launch pad. I went to the launch. So I got some pictures, so I, th I threw, <laughs> threw them in. The launch was in 2011. And this is, I thought this was kind of curious. This is the rocket here. You know, it, it, a couple days before, they rolled it out to the launch pad. But does anyone know what these things are? This is, yes. <laughs> it turns out Cape Canaveral is like the world's capital of lightning. There's <laughs> people come from all over the world to study lightning at Cape Canaveral. <laughs> and it's not good for a rocket. What's that? Who's got the best rocket to get there? Who's, who's the luckiest? What do you mean? Do you Who have, whose rockets are the most likely to get to Mars? Who's got the best rockets? Oh, uh, uh, the U.S. is the only one that's ever successfully gone to Mars. So, yeah, there's no question. <laughs> uh, here's a little, is this, is this plan? I made a little video of the uh, launch. Is it playing? Yep. There we go. So <laughs> that was fun. If you, I've been to a shuttle launch, 
once when shuttle launch and they're pretty dramatic and they move up it moves amazingly slow and then kind of goes out of view over over several minutes well an atlas rocket like this you don't have a human on board so, so you don't care so much about the g-forces and it's just a and it's a it's up and away in just a really short time so nine months after that it starts arriving at uh, at mars and it's going 13,000 miles an hour now when it gets there so so really the hard part is just starting <laughs> uh, when it left Earth, there was a rocket that pushed it on its way, and it coasted, and has, it had solar power for the uh, cruise stage, and it had some thrusters to correct, but it didn't have a lot of, uh, a lot of acceleration, right, uh, ability on that thing. It was a, what they call a ballistic trajectory. So they fought, shot it like a, like a bullet towards Mars, and it just let, flew for nine months and hit right on the target. So if you can imagine, it's like throwing a pass that's mi tens of millions of miles long, and you're mo heading this moving target. Mars is moving along, and you have to coincide just perfectly with it. It didn't orbit Mars and then come in. Our Mars turned around, and they hit it <laughs> right on the button. <laughs> movie on how they actually made it. Oh. I can hear the... I can't hear the voice. The voice filtered out somewhere. So I'll never... I'll never... slowing down. We won't know. It, it takes seven minutes to land and it takes seven minutes for the light to get, get back. So when, by the time we find out what happened, it was all over. So there's no control whatsoever. These are the stages, the steps you have re-entry, you have a parachute, you drop your heat shield, you uh, have radar, collect and find the ground, you separate this, the uh, parachute, you light the rockets, you lower down on rockets, then you get about 20 meters above and you're going to lower the rover on a cable. Yeah, that's just what makes Mars really hard. There's enough atmosphere that if you don't do something, you're going to burn up. So you have to have your heat shield. And you can use a parachute. There's enough atmosphere, but it only gets it down to about 200 miles per hour. So the parachute's good, but it's not quite enough. So then you also have to do something else. You can't hit the ground at 200 miles an hour. You have to do something else. So that's when they have the rockets. Yeah, so Mars atmosphere, 100 times thinner. It's just thick enough that, you, that you'll, you'll burn up if you don't do something about it, but not thick enough to completely slow you down. Yeah, this is a supersonic parachute. Uh, it had 65,000 pounds of force on the chute when it opened, and it caused... The, the, uh, the capsule had 9G force on it for uh, deceleration. So it drops the heat shield, and now it has this radar where it has to map the ground, and it's looking for the place to land. And this was tricky because they told me they wanted to find a very narrow spot to land in. So now they've slowed down to about 200 miles per hour uh, with the parachute, but they're not going to slow down anymore. So they have to eject the parachute and fire the rockets. So now it's on the rockets, and it's still looking. The radar is now looking again. Where's the? Where's my landing spot? And so it's adjusting it. 
It's moving around trying to find the right landing spot. And it gets there. Now those rockets create huge amounts of dust. Like I said, this dust is nasty stuff. So they don't want to have the rockets take it all the way to the ground because they're afraid of what the dust is going to do to the rover. So they're going to stop 20 meters above the surface and lower it down on cable. Which is a crazy. <laughs> That's amazingly realistic terrain, actually. For, it's all obviously it's all computer generated. So they have a you saw the legs unfold right there at the last minute. Comes down now. They have to very quickly cut those cables. There's that descent stage is coming down and it's blowing the dust everywhere. So they cut the cables and that just flies away and you never see it again. It's it's a it flies away and crashes and leaves her over there. <laughs> Not that I know of. The uh, the beauty of that technique well I saw this video. I was working on sample analysis of Mars, the instrument, which is just a passenger in the rover, and w we saw this video a couple years before we, we delivered the, to, to, and we thought, why are we bothering? This is never going to work. <laughs> 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 but it worked. It, it completely worked. And so in 2021, there, there's another rover going, and they're going to do it again. So they can see if they can repeat it. So this is my colleagues at, <laughs> at work <laughs> right after the landing, and everyone was quite happy to see that work. How's my time? You're good. Okay. Uh, this was the first image. It was fantastic. I was at JPL because I got to be on the team that worked the first 100 days. We worked around the clock pretty much for the first 100 days because we were learning how to operate it, and we had to be super careful. Uh, but the very next morning, these pictures, huge three by three foot parents of this picture were all over the all over the place in the operations room. And that, it was amazing, that is Mount Sharp. So that's the mountain in the middle of the crater. That's where they're going. So it was kind of amazing it landed and that was a, a view of where it's going was right in, right in this view. What's that? The that's just a shadow. So, uh, so it's on Mars, and now we had to figure out what we would do. So this is one of the first pictures from Mars, and it really, it tells a lot. Uh, anyone know what's striking about this picture? Exactly. That looks like layers of rock, doesn't it? And the, the reason we, layers on Earth come from sedimentation, typically. Uh, so immediately we're thinking, oh, this looks like potential lake bed. Took some pictures of the wheels moving. There's a nice view of the arm. It's the sophisticated arm. This is the, this is the drill right there. So that arm has seven de degrees of uh, freedom, seven different elbows. Uh, this is kind of cool, the, the chemistry lab. If you look really closely, you can see it fire the laser the rock. <laughs> you can see the little bit of hole in the rock that appears there. <laughs> That's a little zoom of it up there. It's a very, very small hole. Now I just have a bunch of nice pictures of Mars we took at the beginning. There's sunset on Mars. This is beautiful, the, the, uh, the Manganold Dunes, they call this. We didn't actually drive through this. This is a picture of it in the distance, but it's just a gorgeous place. And you can, you know, the scientists look at this and they can, you can see the, the wind blown patterns and they can measure things like wind speed and they can measure the, the type of what this is made out of by the frequency of these waves. Another amazing picture. So here's a good one. One of these is on Earth. Which one? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm colorblind, so <laughs> another one. One of these is Earth. 
The, yeah, the bottom one's the Badlands of South Dakota. Okay, now this is a good one. One of these is Earth, and one of these is Mars. Anyone know? I think if we were to vote, it'd be about 50-50. The left was Mars, and the right was Earth. It's about the same. This was a, one of the other quintessential pictures uh, from Curiosity. Uh, see these stones and pebbles? They're somewhat rounded. They're mixed. Uh, this is a conglomerate. Exactly, that's a conglomerate on Earth formed by the same processes to cement these, these together. This means that, that there was flowing water that rounded these rocks, brought these rocks down from higher altitudes uh, and created these conglomerates and stuff like you'd find on Earth. So this was this picture is sort of evidence that there had been liquid water, f flowing liquid water on the surface of Mars. This is a view from, uh, there, there's several satellites, there are three N NASA satellites orbiting Mars. One of the, the um, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter takes amazing pictures. You can actually see in the pictures you can see the rover if they, if they zoom in enough. Um, this is obviously not the actual rover, but this is the whole path that the, f as seen from space, that Curiosity has traveled. It's about 20 kilometers. Um, Ray Bradbury died about the time Curiosity landed, so they named the landing site after him, Ray Bradbury. I love this picture. This is very recent from uh, maybe the last, uh, couple weeks I believe this is looking back so we have started climbing the mountain we've gone about 400 meters up the mountain uh, we got like 4,500 yet to go we're never gonna get to the top but we'll keep working on it but this is looking back at where we drove so you can see you know this is a really nice vantage point and what we're looking at over there is the edge of the crater if you remember we were the crater so we're on the mountain looking back and it's really neat to see this long distance we traveled Oh, and here's the dunes. I showed you that picture of the dunes, and that's what they look like from there. So some of the results that we found, uh, we found out the Gale Crater was a lake. And at, at, in the first couple months or first year or two, we thought it was a shallow lake or, or maybe like ankle deep or knee deep. Uh, but as we've traveled more up and up, the higher in the mountains, we're short, more sure it was a deep lake. I don't know how deep, but deeper than, than, than I am tall. Or who knows, maybe many, many meters deep. Uh, and so this area of Mars was habitable at some point in the past. Uh, it also means if there was liquid water, then that means it was warmer, uh, and that means they had a thicker atmosphere. Yeah. Liquid carbon dice like pouring. Yeah. Hmm. Because you can be, you know, you can sit, you can be colder, but you had the pressure back in those days. Liquid carbon dioxide could exist in the surface. That would be interesting. I don't know. That's a good question. I'm afraid I don't know the answer. Uh, yeah. Um, another thing we found are the astrobiologists I mentioned that the thousands of them on the <laughs> on the planet Earth. Uh, identified these six m elements as necessary for life as we know it, basically. Carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. Uh, we find plenty of those. Those things definitely exist on Mars. Uh, another thing, this is from my instrument, this, the sample analysis at Mars instrument. Uh, we found lots of organics, lots of evidence of organic molecules. We can't say that those when we say organic molecules, we just mean that they're carbon-based. Uh, it doesn't mean we saw amino, amino acids or something. They could have been naturally forming. Uh, 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 organic molecules form naturally in space. So, but they are there. Like methane? Like methane. In fact, the next result is about the methane. So before we went to Mars, the methane question was very big before Curiosity landed. So we sent an instrument that really specifically look at the methane. So there were wildly different estimates about the methane on, on Mars. And anyone know what makes the methane interesting? Yeah. Where does the methane come from on Earth? Yeah. Right, it comes mostly from life. It comes from cows. It comes from us. It's, it's a common 
uh, life just generates methane. So, but there are geologic reasons for methane as well. But the vast majority of it on Earth is from life. So if you see a lot of, they were seeing a lot of methane, they thought, on Mars. So we wanted to look and really get a good number on the methane. So we sent an instrument that's very accurately measures the methane. And we went there and we found none, or almost none. It was just at the, at just barely measurable at the bottom. It was enough to know that our instrument was working, but it was at the, at its lowest end of, of detectability. Uh, so that was a kind of a disappointment. We were hoping to find more methane. So, but we keep looking every month, we would go look for the methane. And we've been going there for years. And all of a sudden one day, it showed up. It went from, from about 10 times, from about one to 10 uh, on this scale of this instrument. Uh, we're like, wow, there must be something wrong. We've, we've done 20 of these measurements and we've never seen it. So let's, let's just do it again. And we're like, oh, we, we saw it again. It's like, well, let's, that can't be right. You know, so we did it again. We kept seeing it. We kept seeing this 10, 10 parts per billion or whatever. And, uh, and then it went away. It went away again. And then some period later, it came back this, about the same amount. So that's really, we don't know what that means. But, but it means there's an intermittent source of methane on Mars. It could mean there's something living underground. Uh, we haven't, it doesn't seem to be associated with the seasons. Well, we've been there enough, long enough to know that it's not always in the summer or always in the winter on Mars. Uh, but, it's, but we have no idea where it comes from. So it's actually really promising for the ExoMars <laughs> uh, rover looking for life because it could be something underground that vents periodically, something like that. So stay tuned in 2021 <laughs> when ExoMars gets there and drills two meters deep and tries to find something living down there. So we'll keep exploring Mars someday with humans. And maybe some of you kids could be you, not probably not me. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there are 400 scientists working on this. Um, and we've been working for over 2,000 souls. A soul is a day on Mars. So we just passed 2,000 souls. Uh, and it's still going strong. So. All right. Yeah. Uh, I, I know the ExoMars uh, presentation, the part you said, that it only has a seven month design life. I mean, is, are they just being overly pessimistic? Or, because yeah. obviously, That's the once we put something up there, usually, unless it's failed immediately. <laughs> They're gonna. It, 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 yeah, they're not gonna abandon it if it's still working right. fine. Right. It, and was there any, any like, do, do you know of any design decisions that? W when we're designing, the instrument we designed, yeah, we have limited lifetime items that will wear out after so many hours. Okay. S so we specify them to for the, for the seven month mission, okay. and then we like double that, you know, we, for margin. Okay. Yeah. Oh wow! Uh, amazing guy, and he was talking about uh, future Martian uh, projects at that point. This is 2016, and somebody in the audience asked him, uh, "Had he seen the movie Martian with Matt Damon, and, and what did you think of that?" He said he thought it was a fantastic movie. The only quibble he had about it was that big storm at the beginning of the movie. He said there's not enough atmosphere. To do it. <laughs> Actually, I'm getting to a question here. Um, as a programmer. Do you have any idea what the weather is going to be a day out or something like that, or any kind of uh, wind storm that's going to impact your rovers? Do you have any lead time and what can you do as a programmer to shut it down or whatever you do with the rover? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, yes, we know when the, the wind storms are going to come. They're not sudden like they were in the movie. We pretty much could know. They do have these little dust devils that we don't know when they're coming. Uh, but they're not necessarily that dangerous. And like the, the, the air pressure is so low that um, one of the big things, I love that movie too, but that's, you wouldn't really even necessarily feel the wind hardly at all, the, the pressure is so low. So it, it's not that hazardous for the instruments. You never have to shut it down completely? The, we do have to shut down every two years, every 26 months, because Mars is on the other side of the sun and we can't communicate. So from a software point of view, we go into a, a safe mode, a dormant mode, and the fear is that we'll never talk to it again. 
So it sits there and you gotta make sure it's gonna wake up when it needs to and is ready to communicate. In fact, the biggest software challenge is never sending a bad command. So the Viking rover uh, lasted for, one of the Viking rovers lasted, for, not rovers, it was a lander, for four years and then they sent a command that, that an, a bad command that told the antenna to point down. <laughs> and that was the last we ever heard from that. <laughs> so one of our biggest challenges to never ever make a mistake. And now we've, th there's been little mistakes here and there like, I mean imagine like we had the end of a line character uh, was wrong. You know, you change operating systems or something like that. You have a file, you just have one character and the file is wrong. But we have all these safeguards in place. So what happened when, that ha when this bad command went, since it, 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 it was rejected because there's checksums and things to make sure that at least the command's integrity is right. So uh, anyway, that's our biggest challenge. It's not making a mistake. <laughs> Well, w what we do when we operate is we only get data about once a day from the rover. So we don't have, for the lag time, we're, we, we really, uh, every day at 10 a.m. rover time, we send it the commands. It stops at 10 a.m., it points to Earth, uh, and we send it the commands. Then it runs all day, and w we have it programmed to know when the satellites are going over, and it sends its data up to those satellites. Uh, the satellites collect the data and then send it back to Earth. So we see it sometimes a day or many days after after it's gotten up there. Yeah. Uh, so I was wondering, for the I know that the constant would have to be that you have to keep it in the same general area, but would you do it in the exact same spot or like in a very close proximity area? Oh, the methane measurements? Yes. They are several of them when we first noticed that we're, we're pretty much the same area but now we're the rovers constantly moving so we don't go back so yeah the measurements could be kilometers apart uh, so but we don't think it's localized because we could set the same spot and it still might disappear from there so that's a really good question but we don't we never go backwards with the rover so we can't do that experiment to see if it's still there that'd be that'd be good ExoMars, yeah, I had a video here, but I threw it out because I was a time of that landing. It comes down, uh, it has no sky crane. It's very similar, but the, it, it comes down in a capsule that lands with rockets, and it's closed up, and then it opens these doors, and the rover drives out. So they protect the rover inside this capsule Join the like it's, a, it's a more conventional way to do it. it there's a real beauty, though, to to just putting the rover on the ground on its wheels because then it just drives away if they have all this extra complexity of opening these things and driving they have to deploy a ramp and drive down so it's you're trading one complexity for another although I agree it seems a lot saner to <laughs> have the capsule but because <laughs> there was one thing damaged on the rover in the landing one of the well, weather station sensors got damaged by flying debris yeah, question? Uh, one of the which uh, satellite was it that uh, had previously detected? Uh, I don't know if it's MRO or Mars Express. Um, that's good. There were some measurements done from Earth, actually. Uh, that were that what's that? Optical, Optical measurements from Earth, uh, which were apparently turned out to be wildly inaccurate. <laughs> this is very hard, but that's a good question. I don't know uh, where the methane measurements came from before. Uh, the Mars, the uh, yeah, they tried to correct the data and figure, understand why they they had the numbers wrong, but I wasn't I don't I wasn't involved with that. So, good question. Any last questions? Okay, thank you very much. Eric. Thank you guys. Oh, glad you like it. And folks, before you head out, a couple of last thoughts about what's yet to come tonight. We can't say that those, um, when we say organic molecules, we just mean that they're carbon-based. Uh, it doesn't mean we saw amino, amino acids or something. They could have been naturally forming uh, 
uh, organic molecules form naturally in space. So, but they are there. Like methane? Like methane. In fact, the next result is about the methane. So, before we went to Mars, the methane question was very big before Curiosity landed. So, we sent an instrument that really specifically look at the methane. So there were wildly different estimates about the methane on, on Mars. And anyone know what makes the methane interesting? Yeah. Where does the methane come from on Earth? Right, it comes mostly from life. It comes from cows. It comes from us. It's, it's a common, uh, life just generates methane. So, but there are geologic reasons for methane as well. But the vast majority of it on Earth is from life. So if you see a lot of, they were seeing a lot of methane, they thought, on Mars. So we wanted to look and really get a good number on the methane. So we sent an instrument that's very accurately measures the methane. And we went there and we found none, or almost none. It was just at the, at just barely measurable at the bottom. It was enough to know that our instrument was working, but it was at the, at its lowest end of, of detectability. Uh, so that was a kind of a disappointment. We were hoping to find more methane. So, but we keep looking every month, we would go look for the methane and uh, we've been going there for years. And all of a sudden one day, it showed up. It went from, from about 10 times, from about one to 10 uh, on this scale of this instrument. Uh, we're like, wow, there must be something wrong. We've, we've done 20 of these measurements and we've never seen it. So let's, let's just do it again. And we're like, oh, we, we saw it again. It's like, well, let's, that can't be right. You know, so we did it again we kept seeing it. We kept seeing this 10, 10 parts per billion or whatever. And, uh, and then it went away. It went away again. And then some period later, it came back this, about the same amount. So that's really, we don't know what that means, but, but it means there's an intermittent source of methane on Mars. It could mean there's something living underground. Uh, we haven't, it doesn't seem to be associated with the seasons. Well, we've been there enough, long enough to know that it's not always in the summer or always in the winter on Mars. Uh, but it's, but we have no idea where it come from. So it's actually really promising for the ExoMars <laughs> uh, rover looking for life, because it could be something underground that vents periodically, something like that. So stay tuned in 2021 <laughs> when ExoMars gets there and drills two meters deep and tries to find something living down there. So we'll keep exploring Mars someday with humans, and maybe some of you kids could be you, not. Probably not me. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there are 400 scientists working on this, um, and we've been working for over 2,000 souls. A soul is a day on Mars. So we just passed 2,000 souls, uh, and it's still going strong. So. All right. Yeah. Uh, I know the ExoMars uh, presentation, the part you said that it only has a seven month design life. I mean, is, are they just being overly pessimistic or because yeah. obviously that's the once we put something up there, usually unless it's failed immediately. They're gonna it goes well beyond design. If, 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 yeah, they're not gonna abandon it if it's still working right. fine. Right. Uh, and was there any any like do, do you know of any design decisions that w when we're designing the instrument we designed, yeah, we have limited lifetime items that will wear out after so many hours. Okay. So we specify them to, for, the, for the seven month mission, okay. and then we like double that, you know, we, for margin. Okay. Yeah. Eric, two years ago, uh, Novak hosted the uh, Astronomical Lakes National Convention, and our keynote speaker was uh, former NASA Administrator General Charlie Bolden. Uh, oh, wow. An amazing guy, and he was talking about uh, future Martian uh, projects at that point. This is 2016. And somebody in the audience asked him, had he seen the movie Martian with Matt Damon, and, and what did he think of that? He said he thought it was a fantastic movie. The only quibble he had about it was that big storm at the beginning of the movie. He said there's not enough atmosphere to do <laughs> Actually, I'm getting to a question here. Um, as a programmer, do you have any idea what the weather is going to be a day out or something like that, or any kind of wind storm that's going to impact your rovers? Do you have any lead time, and what can you do as a programmer to shut it down or whatever you do with the Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, yes, we know when the, the windstorms are going to come. They're not sudden like they were in the movie. We pretty much can know. They do have these little dust devils that we don't know when they're coming. 
uh, but they're not necessarily that dangerous. And like the the, the air pressure is so low that uh, one of the big things I love that movie too. But that's you wouldn't really even necessarily feel the wind hardly at all. The, the pressure is so low, so it, it's not that hazardous for the instruments. You never have to shut it down completely. The, we do have to shut down every two years, every 26 months, because Mars is on the other side of the sun and we can't communicate. So from a software point of view, we go into a, a safe mode, a dormant mode, and the fear is that we'll never talk to it again. So it sits there and you gotta make sure it's gonna wake up when it needs to and is ready to communicate. In fact, the biggest software challenge is never sending a bad command. So the Viking rover, uh, lasted for one of the Viking rovers lasted for, not rovers it was a lander for four years and then they sent a command that that an, a bad command that told the antenna to point down <laughs> and that was the last we ever heard from that <laughs> so one of our biggest challenges to never ever make a mistake and now we've th there's been little mistakes here and there like I mean imagine like we had the end of a line character uh, was wrong. You know, you change operating systems or something like that. You have a file, you just have one character and the file is wrong, but we have all these safeguards in place. So what happened when that ha when this bad command went since it, 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 it was rejected because there's checksums and things to make sure that at least the command's integrity is right. So uh, anyway, that's our biggest challenge. It's not making a mistake. <laughs> and, yeah? Well, w what we do when we operate is we only get data about once a day from the rover. So we don't have, for the lag time, we're, we, we really, uh, every day at 10 a.m. rover time, we send it the commands. It stops at 10 a.m., it points to Earth, uh, and we send it the commands. Then it runs all day, and w we have it programmed to know when the satellites are going over, and it sends its data up to those satellites. Uh, the satellites collect the data and then send it back to Earth. So we see it sometimes a day or many days after after it's gotten up there. Yeah. Uh, so I was wondering, for the methane modeling, I know that the constant would have to be that you have to keep it in the same general area, but would you do it in the exact same spot or like in a very close proximity area? Oh, the methane measurements? Yes. They are several of them when we first noticed that we're, we're pretty much the same area but now we're the rovers constantly moving so we don't go back so yeah the measurements could be kilometers apart uh, so but we don't think it's localized because we could set the same spot and it still might disappear from there so that's a really good question but we don't we never go backwards with the rover so we can't do that experiment to see if it's still there that'd be that'd be good ExoMars, yeah, I had a video here, but I threw it out because I was with time of that landing. It comes down, uh, it has no sky crane. It's very similar, but the, it, it comes down in a capsule that lands with rockets, and it's closed up, and then it opens these doors, and the rover drives out. So they protect the rover inside this capsule joint. It the like it's, a, it's a more conventional way to do it. it there's a real beauty, though, to to just putting the rover on the ground on its wheels because then it just drives away if they have all this extra complexity of opening these things and driving they have to deploy a ramp and drive down so it's you're trading one complexity for another although I agree it seems a lot saner to <laughs> have the capsule but because <laughs> there was one thing damaged on the rover in the landing one of the well, weather station sensors got damaged by flying debris yeah, question? Uh, one of the which uh, satellite was it that uh, had previously detected? Uh, uh, I don't know if it's MRO or Mars Express. Um, that's good. There were some measurements done from Earth, actually. Uh, that were that What's that? Optical. Optical measurements from Earth, uh, which were apparently turned out to be wildly inaccurate. <laughs> this is very hard, but that's a good question. I don't know uh, where the methane measurements came from before. Uh, the Mars, the uh, 
Yeah, they tried to correct the data and figure, understand why they they had the numbers wrong, but I wasn't. I don't. I wasn't involved with that. So, good question. Any last questions? Okay. Thank you very much. Eric. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Oh, glad you like it.